you know. Maybe it's because it's about to read it. Narf it. Did you jump out of bed today? Did you? Did you? Did you? I know I kind of did. Not really a rollout today, just a jump out. How about you, Mike Myers? I know that we talk about this sometimes, and you literally jump out of bed any time of night, right? Yeah, when you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, it, it is a good feeling in the morning when you could just jump out and do things and be there and do life, isn't it? You know, yeah. Actually, my wife had uh, she said she was going to get up at seven thirty this morning, and I'm I'm like, why? She said, because I, I just need to start getting out of bed earlier, which is, yeah, you waste the day. Well, you do, and it's like you're setting a trend in the house then. If you're up early, she'll take the lead, mm. and then we're all up early. So there you go. Well, yeah, maybe. All right, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night, have an idea for the podcast, write it down, and then use it the next, you nope. know, that morning? I should write it down, but I don't. Okay. And then I forget. Oh, I know. I grab my phone and I have a little thingy on here and it's called, I'm trying to focus. It's called notepad. And I love it. I, it, that is the handiest thing. Cause I'll listen. I'll, I'll be listening to the muck radio 24 seven stream and hear a song. It's like, I have that song. That's a cool song. I'm going to use that today. Seriously. Now, what do you do? You go into your stream directory and pull it out or how does that work? Oh, well, what I can do is uh, it has a history feature. And so I just put down at what time I hear the song, then I can get up in the morning and go pull up the history and go, oh, yep, yep, that's what played there. That's what played there. And then I pull it up on my other computer. That's amazing. That is, that is so It is cool. really handy. I think it's just great you run a live stream 24-7. That's very cool, too. Nobody listens but me. But but you're doing what you love. That's the point. you know. Exactly. Hit it out of the park. You Take me it. out to the ball game. Gene Roddenberry. What's his name? Gene Shepard again? Yeah. <laughs> Roddenberry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to send you another old time because I listened to an interview with Barry Farber. The radio legend just passed away. Got to send you that audio too because he had some great stuff to say on my colleague Frank Morano's uh, podcast and radio show. Frank Morano. See, you know these people I don't know. You know what I'm saying, Thuis? You're, you're from, from there, the big city, and I'm I'm in Boone. And I don't sound like I'm from the big city. I don't have that attitude or that talk. You know, I don't have the voice. I just have a weird, plain old voice. It's not weird. It's, it's not New York, though. It's not like you really can't tell where I'm doing this from because of the voice. Why don't you have more of a New York well, well, I don't know. I just never picked it up or something like that, I guess. I don't know. Huh. Interesting. Did you isolate a lot as a child? Probably because I had a lot of health issues, so that probably was a thing. Yeah. By the way, I, I listened to, I didn't listen to all of it, but I listened to a lot of your interview with your mom. Wow. Oh, the things mothers, you know, in fact, Laura, Laura yeah, that is my current wife. <laughs> oh, geez. We were listening to it and we were both getting a little choked up. Aww. Wow, that's getting scary, man. Laura, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's my yeah, it's not Lisa. Lisa left me long ago. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> well, I'm sure divorce wasn't easy, but are you let me put it this way. Are you A grateful that you've had those experiences and B if you yes. had to do it all over again, would you do live life the way you've lived, you know? With all that other stuff, would you have lived it the same way, or do you think you could have, would have changed things? I uh, had I listened to. Uh, have you ever just been in total denial about something? Sure. You know, maybe your girl. Maybe. No. Well, okay. Well, that's the end of the show. Have a great day. I'll no, talk no. to you later. <laughs> no, seriously. But yeah, because with a, a diagnosis back in the nineteen seventy nine, I knew something was goofy with me because i tend to have really high highs and really low lows oh. and uh didn't realize i mean wow i think i had my first panic attack 
uh, when I was in high school, severe chest pain, um, which was probably an esophageal spasm is what it was. But, but as a focus. male, as focus a male, rate. we can't tell, say we had a panic attack, right? As a male, we really can't say, oh, I'm having a panic attack because it's sort oh, of a stigma funny. there. <laughs> yeah, you can. I mean, men can have periods, they say. So why can't we have? Exactly. I mean, we get emotional well, too. There's no doubt about it. Sure. Sure. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. We do. I'm Are you tearing up on me, Michael. No, I got something in my eye. That's what, oh. we, that's what we guys say. I just got something in my eye. You were just talking about denial though. And I will tell you, you know, my college years, I did do a little more drinking than I should have. And I probably was in denial that I didn't do it, but my mom blew the cover off that lid later in the interview, so. Oh, I'll have to listen to the rest now. Yeah, yep. Oh. Do you remember it, the first time you got uh, plowed? I, uh, mm. Mm. I don't really yes. remember that, I guess, so. Oh. Do you remember what, Stite? What's Stite? Stite was li- these little cans of beer that was probably... Probably six percent. I mean, it's pretty high high octane had, back in the day. We had Rolling Rock. That's the big thing here, and it's Rolling. like a dollar beer. And I just kept oh, oh, and that sick feeling. So you've had the pukes the next day? Oh, multiple times. Oh, isn't it just? But you know, I guess it's good. I'm talking about this. That way, I can get out of my chest, and then you know what? Not do it again. Bingo. Not do it again. That's the whole point of it, right? Well, that's, you know, yeah, that's the learning, the learning part of things. I did that and this happened. So maybe I won't do that again. You hope that's what happens. I, by the way, I got to throw this out there. My, I was going to say your wife, my, she's not your wife. My wife really appreciates the way that you keep me on task. She said, he does a great job of just bringing you back and i said i know and it, I, today's program is going to be called focus you just see what my say my parents say about you they're just happy you keep me in line too they're like yeah we love the way he keeps you in check so <laughs> that's funny huh my mom said and i quote you know mike's good he keeps you in line and keeps you in check and i'm like yeah he kind of does so. well it's a it's a mutual it is it's a good and i didn't even yeah it's, it's a great connection because you know we're both I think we realize we're both a little scatterbrain, and then when two scatterbrains get together, we make it work. <laughs> oh, maybe it's like the scatter, and then it goes like this, and then pretty soon it's like, and then it stucks, and it does. We don't scatter so much. Mm. Do you know what scat is? Scat, yeah, the whole jazz bit that Ella Fitzgerald perfected, actually. Well, uh, or it's like bear scat. Oh, I've heard of that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. What is, so is that poop? Okay. That's okay. Sorry. I always end up going there. <laughs> Something about me and poop. Uh, let me guess. You see a bear in the woods say, oh, I've got a poopy bag for you. Here you go. No, but I, I, I will tell you the first time that I, in fact, the only time I went backpacking up in the mountains in Montana, the uh, my brother-in-law at that time had said, uh, there are bear signs. And I thought, well, cool. So they got signs posted along the trailway that said no 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 bear signs there's areas of poop Mm -hmm. have you ever seen a cub or any uh, so you've seen a you have or have not seen a bear oh yeah i'm sure i have at one time i saw a moose once go through our campground and women screaming that was cool Moose are very, they really don't care where they walk. They just bowl on through. It's really interesting to watch them. And they got that ugly, yeah, like the the, t- the, the, the you know, the antlers, you mean? Well, and the females don't have antlers, right? No, I think that is only the males. I, yeah. And this one went right through the campground. We were... We were out at this picnic table and we saw this moose go right through the campground and women scream, girls screaming, running out of the, it was fun. Anyway, focus. I'm sure that's the most exciting day in Canada though, right? Seeing a moose cross the road. 
<laughs> well, I will tell you what the, we went camping in uh, Yellowstone. Oh, and uh, I was a little irregular. I hadn't, you know, visited the little boys' room for a while. So I woke up one morning. I'm thinking, cool, everybody's asleep. I don't have to worry about it. I poke my head out of the tent door, and lo and behold, there's a bison. Three days later, I finally pooped. Oh, my gosh. Was he, like, Scam- facing you down, or where was he? Just tooling around. We, sh- You know, the giveaway should have been when we got to the campground, we saw these great big bison scat. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> hey, you think Yellowstone's ever going to erupt, or what? I don't know. I mean, that's kind of what people are hoping doesn't happen, I guess. So we'll have to see if that ever does. Because it, like, destroy the whole place? Something like that, or something oh, crazy. That would be good. Yeah. Could, like, split the country or something. I don't know. Huh. I'm always wondering what the San Andreas Fault is doing, though, because that's an active fault line. I mean, that thing is... That's California, right? Yeah, that is California. Wow. And if something happens out there, then the whole country is going to be totally different, but... For now, and that, you know, I think that would be an octave god if something happened with the tectonic plates because he controls the earth. Like, he he shifts things to make us uncomfortable, right? Hmm. You know, I was talking to somebody about that yesterday. This couple that I know, I think they're on day 17 of uh, sobriety. That's my, I'm going to take up smoking because I got a lighter now. Why did I get a lighter focus, Mike? But yeah, they're doing really well. In fact, this young man, uh, well, he's 38. He'll be on the show one of these days soon. Former meth addict. And you've helped him recover, right? That was kind of your helping, helping doing? No, no not, not, not really. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think I, um, I think his sister might be out or she might be on the run mm. you know bottom line is if you don't if you don't want to get well if you know you're sick but a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics don't realize that they're sick right and uh, as we've been saying the san francisco hotel just keep pumping these homeless people with yeah. substances it's really disgusting to me that's just wrong that's there is stuff going on you know i don't know well, I'm going to talk in just a minute or two with this uh, legal expert, Jim Burling. He's the VP of Legal Affairs at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Actually won a Supreme Court case in 2001, by the way. So he is mm. no he is no slouch, and he's been following this whole overreach of the government when it comes to mm-hmm. reopening and when it comes to enforcing the law, what's going on there. We're going to talk to him and, um, and then take it from there. But, Mike, you were going to say something about you were saying how you talked to these people and then was it in reference to God shifting us to make us uncomfortable? Oh, your point. Yeah. He said, this young man said that uh, he believes that God, um, well, and it is true. God does discipline. I mean, he disciplines those he loves. And if you have a parent that doesn't care, it's like, you know, whatever, Mm. but God cares. So he, he disciplines. I think the way he disciplines is very unique. He kind of, he, it's like okay here, here's the rules mm-hmm. you can play in the yard here's his commandments 10 commandments you beautiful area to play in but if you're gonna push it and you're gonna go outside of the yard this safe place that i've made for you you you're gonna suffer the consequences and did i ever feel that multiple times in my young life already i felt that that moving out of his yard his field so to speak to do my own thing and it never works out so and i'm still it's a lifelong thing i'm still doing it i want to i want to be more like him like him and michael i know you got a show at 9 a.m eastern tell us about oh, that's it a, really that's quick. it yeah the, yeah the, you know that's a very polite way of saying he's getting weird i really oh no wait a minute that's i'm project that's projecting are you I got it written down here. Oh, wow. I do. I have the problem. And then 
we talked about this already. And, and I talked to Miles about it. And then I projected on somebody else when it's not their issue. It's mine. And then mm. I'm like, oh, you're the one. Whatever. But uh, 9 a.m. Eastern, focus. Radio Hope, you yeah. got Focus. Uh, what <laughs> about Focus that you're talking about? <laughs> Do you have notes? Do you write things down and say, bring Mike back, bring Mike back, bring Mike back? Sometimes. <laughs> no, I don't. I just let it fly in a memory bank up here. Well, at least you got a memory bank because I uh, – <laughs> I uh, my me- so what was the question? It's okay. Well, well, well it's okay, Michael. We we get it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, focus. What do you want to talk about with focus today? Oh, it. I want to talk about it. Okay. Well, find out what it is at Ooh. nine a.m. Eastern time you on teaser. Radio Hope. Mike, I will see you soon. I'll talk to you tomorrow morning, bud. You're a teaser. Okay. Uh-huh. Bye. But, uh, see you, bud. All right. As for me, I'm moving along to David Burling, uh, Jim Burling. See, I can't even get the name right sometimes. Jim Burling, he is the VP of Legal Affairs at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Let's see how that conversation went. Well, welcome back to this edition of Keeping It Real with Alexander Garrett. And with me now is Jim Burling. He is with the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, first of all, James, you're the VP of Legal Affairs uh, over there. Thanks for joining. My pleasure. And I know that you are, you know, fighting the whole constitutional battle now is how do we reopen constitutionally? And my first question, though, is how much of an overreach have we seen that you, even you guys are fighting right now during coronavirus? You know, when this crisis first happened, everybody was in panic mode and nobody knew exactly what the extent of the virus was, how quickly it was going to destroy life as we know it on earth. And so the reactions that were taken by government agencies were by and large constitutional for what we knew at the time, because local governments, governors, I mean, and have broad emergency powers. But the longer we go into this crisis, the more we learn about transmissibility, the more we learn about how some areas of the country are being affected versus others, the more we learn about what works as far as social distancing. A lot of the measures that were first put in place may have made sense back then, but they're making less and less sense in some states now. Not that some things ever made sense when you have the governor of a state saying you can have sailboats and rowboats, but not motorboats. Clearly, that was completely irrational from the beginning. Uh, but, but quite clearly, it's time for the governors of the various states, and some are, and I give them credit for the thing, saying reassess. All right, we, we could stop everybody from getting sick from any transmissible disease if everybody were locked up in their homes forever. Uh, but then we'd all die of starvation, if not boredom right. and loneliness first. So we, we've got to do better things about this. And it becomes irrational for some governors to continue the draconian lockdowns mm-hmm. we've had in those areas where it's not required medically, but where we do know that the harms are so great. The Constitution says governments can't do things that are completely arbitrary and capricious and irrational. And what may have been rational two months ago is oftentimes less and less rational today. Well, and I'm just reading through you. You have actually won a case in the Supreme Court, uh, Palazzolo versus Rhode Island. I'm sure that was a, uh, you know, cases back then aren't maybe as complex as they are right now. Or what you've worked on before, are they more or less complex than what you're working on now with Corona? No, I think there's equal degrees of complexity. I mean, the the case that I had in Rhode Island, Palazzolo, that was about almost 20 years ago now. Uh, When I argued that, it dealt with property issues that were very complex. What if you buy or acquire property that's already subject to regulations? Can you challenge those regulations in court? And the Supreme Court said yes, in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, agreeing with our side on that. So when you go to a court now, uh, you have very similar constitutional issues as far as when can you sue the government? What can you sue the government over? Where do you sue the government? Uh, These are all basic fundamental questions that, that don't change, just the circumstances 
that surround the constitutional questions change. Now the circumstances, the case that I had dealt with property rights and overregulation of somebody's land because it was declared a wetland and he couldn't use it for any purpose at all, not even to build a little parking spots for a beach club. Uh, and today we have serious issues of entire businesses, entire industries being shut down. And how are you gonna sue? Who are you gonna sue? So these are very complex issues and, and we're spending quite a bit of time looking into what some areas that can be challenged are, what areas make less sense for being challenged. Uh, but we think clearly there are some serious constitutional issues with governments not allowing people to own, to open up, even when, even when an industry or when a business can say, hey, we can do it. We can do it with social distancing. We can get the masks we can get personal protection devices, we can keep our people apart, but at least they can go to work and earn a, earn a uh, living, which is what's so important for so many people. James, I never thought the day would come where actually wearing a mask would sort of be a freeing thing because we could do more um, by just wearing it and going to work. I think that's the whole point. And I remember the CDC was talking about that. They abandoned that plan, didn't they? I feel like they just abandoned that plan. Yeah, I mean, CDC, like everybody else, doesn't really know what to do. We've never had a disease right. quite like this. Um, you know, there have been major pandemics in our history before. In 1918, we had the great flu, uh, the so-called Spanish flu. Uh, it killed millions of people worldwide. Um, but we knew so less little about science back then compared to what we know today. And I think we're all very afraid of having the repeat of those number of deaths. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we don't want to be back in the Great Depression for until and if they come up with the vaccine. So we've, we've learned a lot, but uh, CDC is uh, sometimes pretending to know a lot more than it does about what's the right course of action, what's the wrong course of action. People get it figured out pretty quickly. You recall before the lockdown orders, people were starting to distance themselves. I started to stay away from the light rail in Sacramento. I decided to drive to work instead. And people were doing things like that, making their own choices all across the country. Uh, and people are now making other choices, saying, you know, it's time for me to get out of the house, go back to work. There may be some risk, but it looks like the risk is manageable. Yeah. Coronavirus is a terrible, terrible thing to get, and it causes horrible consequences for some people. But at the same time, not having a job, not having mm. enough food to put on the table, uh, that also has serious consequences. It's disaster waiting to happen. Now, your state, California, because you're right in the head, thick of it in San Jose, your state seemed to be very confused on what they wanted to do essential versus non-essential. Are you seeing an aftermath of that, and are you seeing any legal challenges that you guys are dealing with with all those decisions made early on? Well, we are starting up some legal challenges. We've written a letter, for example, just last week, the first step in a potential lawsuit uh, against the Judicial Council because they simply banned all courts from opening up for evictions. Now, I can understand that some people may have lost their jobs as COVID-19 and they need some kind of relief, but there are simply no evictions possible. A lot of people who have jobs said, hey, I don't have to pay the rent because I'm getting this free rent trick from the state of California and nobody is allowing a unlawful detainer and eviction action to proceed. Well, if somebody doesn't pay the rent for several months and they can pay it, uh, you ought to be able to go to court to prove that. And sure. that's not possible right now. So that's one avenue of potential litigation. Uh, other times, other other litigation out there that we're looking at very carefully uh, deals with some of the more draconian orders as far as free speech, assembly, that kind of thing. Uh, we think that you know the, the panic reaction can somewhat be excused two months ago, but to continue this into the future is making less and less sense. So what is your advice to, because uh, you guys are beyond the Pacific Coast, you're all over the place. So What's your advice? How are you advising states even to open up right now at, at the Pacific, Pacific Legal Foundation? Yeah, I, I would say that you've got to have a, a balancing, looking at the rights on one side that are being 
uh, limited or destroyed, uh, the inability to go to work, the inability to go to church, and then look at what you're going to get from that. Is this really justify the emergency uh, powers that the governors have been asserting and some local governments have been asserting? And I would say in some cases, uh, the balance is no longer there. We've learned enough that we know that we ought to be looking much more carefully at what the real risks are in a particular community. And every community is different. And every community sure. has to be looked at differently. We are all, thank God, not New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. You could be up in the middle of Montana, the middle of Idaho, and it's a much different problem. Uh, people living in rural areas, look, they've been social, they've been social distancing for their entire lifetime. They're ready for this. Right. right. I mean, uh, they just have to be careful when you get together for going to church or something like that. But people are willing to be careful. No, nobody wants to get the COVID-19 disease. Right. They want to be careful about it. But at the same time, uh, in some areas of the country, if it's not rational, then they then you're subject to being challenged in court. I haven't had a legal expert on to talk about this, but the Dallas salon owner, it's still it, it, I'm twisted with that because at the same time you want to abide by the law, but what did you think of that case overall and how th that was handled? Well, I mean, insanity takes many forms, right? So here we had a salon owner that wanted to carefully open her salon a few days ahead of time. And apparently the court, the, the local, uh, the, the local government officials uh, and the court thought it would be perfectly okay to send her to jail for seven days for violating the order. But I guess it made sense because they had let out so many criminals out of the jails. They had extra room, I guess, and they had to fill them up again. I mean, the, the whole thing is, is like Franz Kafka, one of these absurd uh, novels of the, night of the 20th, early 20th century. I mean, it, 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 it makes no sense. Now, here is a case where if people just got together and said some common sense, okay, she opened a few days early, maybe you could, you know, tisk tisk, uh, give her a $100 fine saying don't do it again, but send her to jail for seven days where it's only going to increase her risk of getting something in jail and coming back out and spreading that around where you're letting criminals out at the same time? I mean, Honest to God, convicted criminals are being let out early yep. so they don't get sick. Oh, you know, uh, that's a choice that you can make, but be consistent. I mean, you, you're treating a hairdresser worse than a criminal? Come on. Oh, well, and even here in New York, we're seeing social distance ambassadors now. Like, we, you know, we're had to be told to be social distanced by someone else. It's, it's almost anarchic, and it is feeling fascist right now. I mean, I can't, I can't say it any other way. Well, look, you go, you go to China and they've developed this thing called social credit, where if you're a, a good person and you stand up and cheer when the national anthem is being played in China, uh, then you get high social credit marks. But if you, you know, grumble a bit or complain or write a nasty letter on uh, WeChat or something like that, then your social credit goes down and you have fewer rights to travel, fewer rights to a good job, and that kind of thing. And are we getting to that point where all of the neighbors are going to be paid to snitch on other neighbors? You know, when I was growing up, we'd hear about these things happening in Soviet Union and Cuba, where neighbors would snitch on other neighbors about not following the party line or having a few more extra grains of rice than somebody else than they're supposed to. Uh, and we're getting to that point now. Look, if, if I am, if I want to go out without a mask, uh, it's, you know, I'm stupid. If I wanted to do that, I think it's a good idea to have a mask in certain places. Uh, but it's, it's not my neighbor's business to enforce that against me. Right. Uh, I mean, we are a country of individualists. We're a country based on the concept of individual freedom, not collective rights or collective freedom. And we need, to, we need to realize that when we are a country of free people, we have to act like free people and we have to let people be free. And when you have a crisis, it's a great excuse for the totalitarian instinct in people to come in and take control and command things for the crisis, right? For the right. crisis. But every time we have a crisis, it's just a little harder to back away from that. We get a little more freedom taken away, a little more hard, a little more permanently. 
And the, the left says, well, we should never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, right. I say we should use this crisis as an opportunity for more freedom rather than less. Well, we're talking with James Burling. He's the Vice President of Legal Affairs at Pacific Legal Foundation. Thanks for joining me on this pod. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. And you got all this experience. I love hearing about it from you directly. So, James, have you gotten word from Michigan? Have you gotten anybody from Michigan ready to sue Governor Whitmer? Well, people already have sued. Uh, we're not involved in those lawsuits, but some other, uh, other people have sued, and I've looked at some of that litigation, and it, and it does make sense. Now, uh, quite true, everybody realizes these cases are not going to be easy because you're oftentimes dealing with courts that have a certain sympathy for government action. Uh, a lot of judges are former government lawyers, former politicos, if you will, who are very dialed into the system. And it's a little difficult for a number of judges to say that, hey, maybe the government, maybe the state or the county is acting wrong and I should rule against them. But mm. some of the cases do have some merit because when the conditions that are being imposed lack a rational basis, when they lack any kind of procedural due process. And what, what I mean by procedural due process is you should have the ability of going to court and saying, or first of all, going to your local government saying, this restriction on me is too severe. It mm. doesn't make any sense. And I want an opportunity to have an exception for me, for my business, so that I can, I can prove that we can operate my business safely. We can keep social distancing. We can make sure that people are wearing masks. We can put up plexiglass partitions between some of the workers. There's a whole variety. We can, we can stagger shifts. Uh, we can do all kinds of things. But if there's no opportunity, a meaningful opportunity to go in and, and prove that you can operate effectively that way, then it becomes something of a violation of due process. Um, you know, we, we have here in California, um, Elon Musk, you may have just heard yep. this recently. Yeah. He's trying to get the Tesla plant reopened. Now, I, I'm, I'm a, a lukewarm fan of Elon Musk because so I. he is some, somebody who is awfully happy to feed at the government trough when it's convenient. But he put together a plan where he thought he could reopen the plant and it was simply turned down. And he's pretty unhappy about that. He says, well, if I ever do any more manufacturing, it's not going to be in California. It's mm. going to be in Texas or a friendlier state. Now, I've been saying that for years. Who in their right mind would open up a business in California? Well, Elon Musk did because he was getting tons of subsidies, quite frankly, right. from the state government. But uh, that, that, so if he's ticked off at California, you better imagine that people are pretty unhappy with governments. And I, I think Michigan is a classic example of that. California is another one. Well, I... I've got to ask you because a lot of all these, a lot of people are also directing their anger at China. And we're starting to see at least one state do it where they sued China. Um, anybody gutsy enough to, you know, do it in California? Have, has anybody brought that idea up yet? Of, of suing China in California? Su or yeah. having China sue California? Any, I mean, California sue China? Yeah. Any, any talk of that from not, I, liberals, you know, obviously, but. No, there aren't too many people talking about suing China here to try to get some kind of relief. Um, it's it's the sort of thing you would file a lawsuit against China to make political points, perhaps, or to make a statement. But the law that's going to allow you to sue China and try to get any relevant information out of the Chinese, that's just that's going to be really, really difficult because the Chinese, it's a totalitarian society in many ways. It's not completely totalitarian like it used to be, I guess, but it's getting more and more returning to that. Yeah. And they don't have a Freedom of Information Act request. You're simply not going to file a lawsuit against them and try to engage in discovery and get their documents about who knew about the disease and when, uh, who knew at the lab outside of Wuhan what was going on, or... Uh, there are all sorts of many, many questions everybody would love to have answered from China. Problem is, China's not going to answer those questions, and us suing them isn't going to make them answer thing any quicker than anything else. And if I, you were to sue, 
with a favor, you know, with a friendly judge here in California or anywhere else in the United States, what are you going to do? Get money from the Chinese? You're going to ask the Chinese to what? Give up Shanghai or something? That's that's uh, it's uh, not very realistic. So I think it's the sort of thing that might make somebody feel good, but as far as the legal p potential of having a successful suit against China, uh, you know, I think it's just as likely that China is going to become an open democratic society in the next two weeks. Hey, James, you know, you just mentioned, you know, the, the courts over in California, the Ninth Circuit is a very famous one. Uh, what changes have you seen on the Ninth Circuit the last few years? Anything improving over there? And have they ruled against businesses during this time as well? Oh, by all means. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you've taken the Ninth Circuit, which has gone from absolutely atrocious to merely bad. Uh, and that's tremendous progress here in California because we've had a lot of new judicial appointments by President Trump. And those new judicial appointments are, uh, without question, excellent, excellent choices for the Ninth Circuit. Now, we still have a majority of appointees from prior administrations who are less favorable to a more freedom-oriented uh, looking look at how to interpret laws and a, a less originalist view. And they can get the majority, but it, in a court as large as California, where you have over 30 judges, you have three judge panels that will be on your initial case. And so your odds of getting two judges on a three judge panel that have uh, rational ways of looking at how to interpret statutes in the Constitution is much greater. You're much more likely to get a rational court than you were just a few years ago. And if you have a decision that goes the wrong way, you can ask for the entire Ninth Circuit to rehear the case in what's called an unbanked panel. And there your odds are much better of that happening. Now, it, it's still, we, we still have a ways to go. We've had four years of pretty good appointments and many years of very bad appointments. And for various statistical reasons, a vast expansion during the Jimmy Carter years has, ex mm. has carried on from Democratic president to Democratic president. And only now has that logjam been broken. Um, so I'm optimistic about the Ninth Circuit. A lot of what the future is going to hold will depend on what happens in November. And I'm not talking about a resurgence of the coronavirus. I'm <laughs> returning about a resurgence of the uh, left-wing liberal bias in the White House and Senate. Uh, speaking of that, in November, your governor just did mail at home. Is there a danger with that mail at home voting? You know, California is one of the few states where vote harvesting is legal. You may have recalled the little blow up in North Carolina a couple of election or two ago where a Republican had been found to have had some of his operatives were collecting mail-in ballots and then submitting them en masse. That's illegal in North Carolina, uh, but it's perfectly legal in California. And we had instances where poll workers were dropping off or uh, politicos in the Democratic Party were dropping off hundreds of mail-in ballots. That was legal, but certainly way open to abuse. Now, the next election, it's all going to be mail-in. Now, we had that option before of doing it all mail-in as well, and everybody was uh, actually had received a mail-in ballot, but they still could go to the polling place to mm. drop off their ballots, but that's not a, going to be an option anymore. So the challenge of vote harvesting is who's going to be out there harvesting the votes and who's going to be checking on that? Uh, mm. And I think it's a system that is just going to be subject to potential abuse. It will be abused. I mean, look, elections in this country are free and fair, uh, but we all know for a long time, many uh, people who are very uh, ambitious, if you will, would mm. buy votes. Uh, there's walking around money in some of the major urban centers where people would buy votes. And part of the ban on ballot harvesting, which is going around to a whole bunch of people and collecting their absentee ballots, was to prevent votes from being bought and sold. Well, that's legal in California. Um, I say it shouldn't be, but um, the people who control this state think it's a dandy idea 
they say, this is going to help the poor and the minorities to vote because we're making it easy as possible that anybody can vote. Somebody can show up at your door and say, hey, would you like to vote? Yeah, but I'm too tired to get out. That's okay. I have a form to fill out. You just want to sign your name? What if I sign your name for you, right? Who's going to figure it out? And That's so uh, California is, is far to the left, and things like this are just going to keep it there. Uh, has Pacific Legal, Legal dealt with something like that? Have you guys had any cases with vote harvesting issues? No, we haven't had a case of vote harvesting because, as I said, under California law, vote harvesting is legal. Uh, and we would love to get the legislature to change that, but the legislature has no inclination to change that because vote harvesting helps the status quo. As I said, we are one of the only states where vote harvesting is legal. Uh, so uh, we are an outlier, but then again, California is an outlier in so many other things. And what I think the more serious problem is, because California is a lost cause, right? Uh, yeah. But other states where people are advocating for more access to voting booths through mail-in voting, uh, look at and make sure that they're not going to at the same time slip in a weakening of the restrictions against vote harvesting. The idea that some people just can't get together 50 cents or a stamp and mail in, well, it, it's, they're stamp free anyway. They're, they're usually right. free in most places. But most, some people just simply won't have the ability to open up a ballot and mark the X's and send it in. So they need help. And if you hear that we're going to have a program to help people vote, watch out. Because if you have mail-in votes and helping people vote, you are going to have fraud. And so be careful when this movement tries to sweep away from California into the rest of the country. Uh, as I said, we're a lost cause, but not... Not all the other 49 states are as uh, far off as we are. Well, James, I know that it's it's kind of tough to have legal issues there if everything is legal, right? So the, the challenges, is, from what you're saying, seem to be far and few between. So what are you guys working on to protect liberty and not have the total erosion of it in California? Well, not so much with the voting issues, because I said that's probably – but we what we are focusing on in California – deals a lot with property rights, uh, the ability of government to stop use, you from using your property if you wanna build a home or a small apartment complex. Uh, we are challenging that. We're, we're challenging the ability of government to demand extortion in exchange for your ability to use your property. And I use that term deliberately when I say extortion because we had a case against the California Coastal Commission a number of years ago where the Coastal Commission said that if you want a permit to rebuild a home, you have to give to us some of your property. And we had a case where the Coastal Commission was asking for a third of somebody's land oh in exchange God. for a permit. That went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court called that an out-and-out out plan of extortion and said, no, you can't do that because you haven't shown that developing this home creates the, a need for the public to have a third of your property. Uh, we had a similar case in Florida just a few years ago where a local government in Florida was asking somebody to spend about a quarter million dollars to fix drainage on government property about five miles away from the development site. Somebody wanted to build a, a, some a small set of stores, and he was told he had to spend a quarter million dollars to help uh, fix property down the, down the street. And they were saying, well, the case that we won in California, that was for that land. We're only asking for money here. And we won that case of the Supreme Court as well. But nevertheless, government, yeah, but governments continue to try to find ways of extorting things that, oh, in, in that case out of Florida, the Supreme Court referred to it as extortion about six times in the decision. So um, I'm not making that word up. The court saw it for what it was. But some courts are trying to find loopholes in those decisions. And so mm. they find a loophole. We go to court to, to close that loophole. Hey, uh, have you got any cases from New York? Because clearly you're Pacific legal, but you're nationwide. So any New York cases you can update us on? Uh, we've had some cases in New York. Uh, we've been involved in uh, New York City with uh, Mayor de Blasio, who's been trying to 
eliminate some of the exceptional schools that uh, New Yorkers have sure. for the gifted students. And de Blasio is saying that, well, look, not enough of certain minorities go to these schools. So we have to change the criteria to make sure we get more minorities. But it's, the, it's one kind of minority versus another kind of minority. Because Asian students who have been working particularly hard to get into these students have had a great deal of success. And Mayor de Blasio doesn't apparently like that. He'd rather have other minorities get some of those coveted spots uh, as well. And we think this kind of racial discrimination has no place in America. It hasn't had any place in America since 1865 when we had a war to stop that kind of racial uh, stereotyping right. and racial discrimination. And, and so we are relying on constitutional amendments were, that were adopted in the wake of the Civil War to say, Mayor de Blasio, you can't do this. Those cases are proceeding apace. Uh, and uh, I hope to have some progress to report in uh, due course. Please do, because it sounds like that case is ongoing right now. Is that right? That is correct. So we will definitely, and you know what's interesting is, because now almost every turn you see him, he always hate, wants to combat anti-hate crimes against anybody. But as you say, trying to withhold people from a good education is a hate crime, in my opinion. Maybe yours too. Yeah, it, it's, it's unconscionable that if you have a kid who just works his rear end off, studies really, really hard, works really, really hard in order to get a place in one of these coveted schools. And no doubt, this kid's parents are behind him, breathing down his or her neck every yeah. inch of the way, because we all know without parents really pushing kids, a lot of kids will say, hey, you know, I'd, I'd much rather play on my uh, video game instead. So you have a lot of parents who are making a lot of sacrifices of time and effort to get their kids to work hard. They get it. They deserve to be in the places that they, they work for. Now, I understand that there are minority communities where it's difficult because you don't have the strong two-parent households that you may have in other communities. Uh, right. But there are better ways of dealing with those kind of issues, like fixing the schools that are there now. Uh, giving those kids more opportunities. If you think there should be more excellent schools, then create more excellent schools so Definitely. all kids can have excellent schools. Uh, we, we don't have a shortage of good ideas, but we have a shortage of will on the part of education officials to say, we need to have accountability. We need to have an ability in New York City to get rid of teachers who are not performing. We need to have discipline instilled in our schools that is lacking right now because we're too afraid to impart discipline because that may have an adverse impact on a child's psyche. But what about the other 29 kids in the classroom that are dealing with this kid that won't control himself? Right. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's time that we make sure that all kids are given the maximum opportunity to succeed rather than letting a few bad kids or bad teachers drag everybody down. Well, don't tell anybody, okay? But I hate rubber rooms just as much as anybody else. And I'm not supposed to say that in New York, but I just do. Uh, so, James, I got to ask you then, are you close with Eva Moskowitz? Like, have you worked with her on all of this? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, but, you know, we will work with anybody who, who does good stuff. And, but I just have not yet had that opportunity. Because she is a, a staunch supporter of charter schools, as you probably well know. Yes. So, and I think, and charter schools are, you know, it's, it's funny and ironic in a lot of ways. You look at the support that charter schools had at one time across the political spectrum from Democrats and Republicans, but then some of the teacher unions, quite frankly, decided that they didn't like charter schools because it had an adverse impact on them. It might create accountability in the teaching ranks. Yeah. And they've come on, I think, highly irrationally against the idea of charter schools where they should be welcoming competition. I mean, look, I'm in the law business and competition is good. It keeps us on our toes. Yep. You're in the broadcasting business. Competition is good for you. You know, it would be nice at one, you think one hand, if I was the only broadcaster doing podcasts <laughs> out there, everybody would listen to me. It would be perfect. But the competition keeps you on your toes. And schools are no different. Competition keeps schools on their toes. Yeah, competition is hard. Competition can create stress. But you know what? Stress can create good things. If you know you've got, if you've got to be looking behind your back and figuring, 
well, who's coming up behind me? I might have to run harder. I might have to work harder. Yep. Well, yep. that's good. And that's what, that's what's a good thing for kids. James, and I'm, I still feel like a kid at podcasting, so I'm always trying to keep at this. But uh, James, I got to ask you, so 1619, this whole New York Times essay about back then, you know, the slavery, I don't know if you're going to do it or not, but it's now going to be in public schools. So you might see challenges to that too, the curriculum changing. Oh, it's, you know, first of all, the 1619 Project, I think a, a vast number of reasonable non-ideological historians have looked at that and said, it's just a load of nonsense. I mean, you can look at articles in Wall Street Journal on down and a number of other places, left and right, and said, eh, we don't think so. But it is so politically correct that we can, because there is a, a move to do whatever you can to denigrate capitalism to denigrate the uh, entrepreneurial spirit that has made this country great. And if you are an anti-capitalist, if you don't like capitalism, you'd rather have a form of socialism. And a lot of people apparently think that's not a bad idea, including a presidential candidate who may or may not give up. Uh, then the 1619 Project is perfect. Um, but you know, we have so much indoctrination going in our public schools uh, which is why I think you have a charter school movement, which is why there's a homeschooling movement. Yeah. And that's yeah. why there's a pushback against homeschooling uh, by people who, you know, there's an article that was just put in a prestigious journal a little while ago complaining that the problem with homeschool is that children don't get exposed uh, to this multi-dimensional uh, sexual orientation, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but that's something that parents should choose. You know, I, whether you agree or don't agree with those sort of moral judgments and moral values, uh, that's something that parents should be able to choose. And if parents want to homeschool, that's the parents' rights. What's important is that kids get a good education. And there's kids get a good education in charter schools. They get a good education in homeschools. They get a good education in some public schools. Um, but you know, give parents a choice. Parents are not stupid. They love their kids and they want what's best for their kids. And they want their kids to be raised in an environment that instills the values that those parents believe in. Uh, then parents should certainly be free to do that. And by the way, we're just seeing a whole, uh, you know, a whole positive thing about the e-learning that the, the parents now know what the kids are doing with their classes. And that is a good thing, I think. Because why would you want to pay for your kid to have a class and not know what's going on in it? Yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be rather eye-opening if parents are listening to some of this indoctrination that goes on in some of the classrooms. Like I remember when our kid was small and he would bring home the textbooks, and I would look at the indoctrination in them, and I I would just roll my eyes and I say, you know, Tommy, it's not necessarily <laughs> real. It's it's just you know dreams about kids and polluting the world, and the world is in, coming to an end because they threw away a paper wrapper in the wrong place. I mean, just this heavy handed political, ideological, particular moral viewpoint indoctrination in some of the schools in California, you know, get back to our, my home, my adopted home state uh, is particularly notorious in that, that so many things have to be learned. Uh, you have to talk about the sexual orientation of the people in history. Like who cares hmm. one way or the other? Um, but apparently some people do, but that's, that's not, I mean, they should be teaching what, reading and writing and arithmetic, uh, mm -hmm. mathematics, science, um, uh, all kinds of things that they're not teaching well enough. And we put this other stuff on top. I, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm glad my kid is grown now. He's grown up and, uh, he thinks a lot like I think. Well, and I do think though, if you're going to go do a class, if you're going to have a class, you have to do it in a way that, um, shapes the mind to get out of hatred, not anti-Semitism, not form that in the classroom, which is happening. I feel like kids are being bred to hate right now. Yeah, you can't, you can't substitute one form of hatred for another, right? You can't right. say, well, we, we shouldn't hate Arabs. Absolutely, we should not hate Arabs. But that doesn't mean you have to hate Jews, right? Exactly. You shouldn't hate exactly. anybody. I mean, I mean, I was raised that we should love thy neighbor as thyself. Every great religion has that strong moral value that you have to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Right. The golden rule. Uh, and you don't get that if you start tearing down another culture, if you start tearing down 
uh, various traditions. You can question traditions when they've done things wrong, and you need to point out when people do things that are wrong. But at the same time, uh, don't destroy people in the process. Don't make it your own specific diversity, which is they, the word they love to toss around. And yet you're reminding me that they do it by tearing down someone else. So it's not really diversity, is it? it it's not diversity. It's, it's my diversity over your diversity, mm. uh, my tribe over your tribe. And my point is all tribes are wonderful. Uh, yes. but let's, and let's not tear down one tribe at the expense of the other. Let's build everybody up at the same time. Hey, James, a couple more questions before we wrap up. First of all, uh, are we in a constitutional crisis more than ever before? Like, are we in, are, is this COVID challenging the Constitution, like stretching it? And, and are the governors stretching it to what they believe they should stretch it to? Uh, we have been in similar situations in the past. Um, we had a great constitutional crisis at the Civil War, right? And that was resolved through the blood of hundreds of thousands of young men and some young women as well. Uh, we had a, a constitutional crisis of a form during the Great Depression, where a large number of command and control regulations are put in place, where contracts, uh, many cases were written, were torn up and rewritten. And we got through a lot of that. Uh, there's still some legacy of the Great Depression that has affected our freedom since then, but by and large, we survived. And now we have another crisis. And, and my concern is it's often it's a one-way ratchet. Every crisis just ratchets the freedom just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Big crisis, quite a bit more. And things are difficult to relax after the crisis is over. So mm. whatever we're going to do with dealing with COVID-19, uh, we have to make sure it's temporary. And one of the things that we've been trying to focus on and say, look, we have too many restrictions right now on your ability to open a business, on your ability to use your property, on your ability to earn a living without having to go through ridiculous licensing procedures. Now is a time where we should loosen up and make it easier for people to work, to have a business, because God knows we're going to need to get businesses back in, in the saddle. And we have had so many businesses that are being permanently wiped off the face of the earth uh, that aren't coming back. And we need new businesses to replace them. So we need to use this opportunity not to have our freedoms permanently dialed back a little bit, but our freedoms permanently expanded to the status quo ante where they used to be before we uh, created this regulatory state that we have now. And so as you talk about businesses and getting them open and everything, what can Pacific Legal do for the business person today to open up and open up constitutionally as well? What we're looking at right now is those states that are not allowing any kind of flexibility. And we would love to get involved and help represent some businesses. We've had some talks with people in different parts of the country about this, saying, look, if you don't have an option, of trying to prove that you can open up safely and you can do it in a manner that's not going to endanger public health and safety, you should be given that opportunity. And so we're looking at cases like that. Uh, we're looking at cases where other freedoms, such as freedom of speech, have been infringed upon. So I, I think there is uh, going to be opportunities for those states that are too slow in getting back to business to dial back on some mm. of the restrictions. So there, there very well could be uh, litigation. Well, and where can people reach you or reach the PLF? Uh, where, 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 where can we reach you? So go to our website, pacificlegal.org. Uh, that's pacificlegal, one word, dot O-R-G. And uh, there's a form on there for letting us know about your case and your issue. Uh, look at it, fill it out. And uh, spend some time going around the website. We have some interesting cases that we talk about, and we do it in terms that a non-lawyer can read and understand and actually enjoy. Uh, it's, in other words, I didn't write it all. Uh, and so it's written, it's written in an accessible way. And so go to pacificlegal.org and, and take a look at it. And I, and I think you, uh, your listeners may find it uh, not only entertaining, but also quite informative. And you're inspiring me because, you know, a lot of the time I want to just 
focus on the content, but what we're doing here and how you want to help, it just inspires me to tell people, do not sit back. You have options to really face this head on, don't we? Yeah. I mean, and, and we certainly can't, you know, we're, we're a limited number of lawyers. We can't get involved in every case in every state, but good cases can be filed and people should do what they can to assert their rights in a lawful and reasonable manner. Um, because if people don't stand up for the rights, who's going to do it, right? Not You just can't have somebody do it all for you. And if you are a business person or somebody trying to express yourself, uh, somebody trying to practice your religion, and you think the restrictions are too harsh, that no longer makes sense, then it's time to speak out. And that could speak out publicly, it could speak out on media, and it could mean speaking out in court by filing an action. James, I might have you back next week, as early as next week, because who knows what we could see out of New York once the reopening starts. It could be some file, some issues right away on May 15th, so let's keep an eye on that. Absolutely. All right, James Burling, he is the VP of Legal Affairs at the Pacific Legal Foundation, pacificlegal.org. Thanks so much for joining tonight. My pleasure. Good talking with you. I'm Alex Garrett, and we will talk to you tomorrow. This was so good.